thank you all for coming. Uh, I realize this was a jam-packed uh, uh, time slot, and thank you for choosing this one. I know there are much sexier topics being talked about right now. Um, who am I? My name is Michael Manella. I'm the project lead for Spring Batch as well as Spring Cloud Task. Um, I do a whole bunch of other things. Author, I was an expert group on the JSR for Batch. Um, you can reach me at, at Twitter, um, at Michael Manella. Um, also, uh, I'm on a podcast called Off Heap. Uh, if you want to hear a couple of guys in a bar uh, basically talking about stuff that's happening on the JVM, check us out. It's uh, at Off Heap on Twitter. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, et cetera. Um, one other thing I don't have a slide for, but I did want to mention, uh, Pivotal's hiring. Uh, specifically, even the Spring team is hiring. So if you are interested in anything you hear about at this conference, feel free to talk to me. Uh, I want to, you guys specifically uh, are the ones that we want to be talking to. Slides and code will be on GitHub soon, so don't uh, fret too much about taking notes or anything like that. Um, and please ask questions when you have them. It's the best time. And I would much rather make sure that you are all, all your questions are answered as opposed to me getting through all this material. Quick lay of the land. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here is comfortable with Spring Framework. If not, I'm sorry, this is going to be a really boring talk. How many, a quick show of hands, how many people here are comfortable with Spring Batch? Sweet, all right. Spring Cloud, ah, impressive, all right. Spring Cloud Task, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and Spring Cloud Dataflow, okay, okay. Um, so after that keynote, um, I want to talk today about what is probably the most sexy topic you're going to hear about in this entire conference, batch processing. And while it is old, I mean, it goes back literally to the dawn of computing. Um, on a modern cloud-based infrastructure, it is still a very, very powerful tool and very relevant in today's world. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to work on an app. We're going to build an app, and then we're going to iterate over it, adding additional features to take it from a basic boot run uh, on a, a laptop batch application all the way to a cloud-native application. We're going to do that iteratively. Um, the app we're going to build is really straightforward. Uh, internet uh, willing, we're going to pull some files off of S3, and we're going to import them into a database. You'll see really quick that this is a mind-numbingly simple batch job. It's because I don't want to focus on the domain model or any of that type of stuff. I really want to focus on the mechanisms that we're using to, to process it. Obviously, we're going to use Spring Batch as the processing model for this, or, or the framework to build this pro batch process, uh, because it provides all the basic batch functionality. So things like state management, jobs, steps, uh, transitions, all that type of stuff is built into Spring Batch. And that hasn't changed whether you're deploying locally or on a cloud. If you've been following along, uh, Spring Batch 4 went GA uh, Monday, so yesterday. Um, it is actually the first major GA, uh, major release for Batch in, I think it's four years now. So it's been a while. Um, to give you an idea how long ago that was, uh, that the year that Spring Batch 3 came out, the iWatch was the new and cool thing. And now I bet half the people in this room have them on the wrist. But more importantly, Spring Batch 4 is the first major release since Spring Boot came out. Spring Boot was announced the year Spring Batch 3 came out. And so we took this opportunity as a way to look at how the landscape has changed since Boot came out. Because we develop applications very differently today than we did before Spring Boot. Some of the things that we did, uh, first of all, rebaselined everything for Java 8. Um, so Java 8 is the minimum requirement for Spring Batch 4. Uh, Spring Batch 3 was based on Spring Framework 4, which so we're all the way back to JDK 6. Um, so some pretty old technology. For you, if you're already running batch processes, this should be a transparent change. Spring Framework 4 brought a full Java 8 story with it, and we Spring Batch just worked natively with that anyways. This is more for us internally. We haven't been able to use all the cool stuff in Java 8 within the framework. And so now that gives us an opportunity to both uh, use those idioms as well as clean up a lot of things that we had to do to jump through hoops so that it did work all the way back to Java 6. We also upgraded all the things. So all of the baseline, all of the dependent projects have been upgraded uh, to be in line with Spring Boot 2. So um, that uh, includes, to, to Phil's comment earlier about choices, uh, some of your choices may have been removed. Um, so, for example, Caster, I believe, is, is a serialization mechanism for XML. Uh, that's being, that was dropped with Spring Framework 5, so we've, uh, you won't be able to use that with Spring Batch going forward as, an, as one example. 
Um, and then we're requiring Spring Framework 5 as the baseline. Uh, for the stuff that you're doing with Batch, it should be a pretty transparent uh, uh, thing. The only real hiccup I've, we found, even just doing that migration ourselves, was um, going back to the choice thing, Hibernate. Uh, Spring Framework 5 dropped support for some of the older versions of Hibernate. Uh, dropped hi support for Hibernate 3 and 4. You are required to use Hibernate 5 now. So there were some intricacies there. But that was really the only speed bump we even hit upgrading to Spring Framework 5. Uh, so I, we would expect you to have a relatively seamless upgrade path. With Spring, uh, Spring Batch 4, we also added builders for all of the readers and writers and processors that we provide out of the box. While when Batch 3 came out, XML was still a heavily used way of configuring bat, uh, Spring applications. That isn't the case anymore. And if any of you guys have tried uh, configuring something like the flat file item writer or uh, flat file item reader in Spring Batch using Java config, you know that's like a page of, of Java uh, code that really doesn't need to be a page of Java code. Um, so we've simplified that quite a bit and provided builders now for all the readers and writers uh, that are available. One other feature that I don't have a slide for but I want to show um, is our documentation. We took a, uh, this is another opportunity to upgrade our documentation. So move from docbook to ASCII doctor, something you don't care about. But one thing you, I hope you do care about is we've added this little toggle at the top of every one of our pages. And specifically, uh, we now provide examples of everywhere that there's a configuration example. We provide both XML configuration examples and Java config examples. And you can select which one you want to see for the entire document using this toggle. So I flip the XML and it switches in line. The idea being that most applications are one or the other. Either you're working with Java config or you're working with XML config. So we didn't want to have both and have you sift through that. So now you can literally read the document as though it's written for whatever use case you're using. I'm looking for feedback specifically on this. So please, as you try it out, don't be shy. Oops. Sorry about that. So let's take a look at the app we're actually going to build. Uh, like I said, we're going to use Spring Batch 4. We're going to bring, build a single job. We'll call it the S3 JDBC job, because we're pulling files from S3, and we're going to slam it into a database. That's going to have a single step called load. Um, and it's going to have three main components. A flat file item reader. That's going to read the data from the files that we download from S3. We'll have an enrichment processor that I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and then we'll have the JDBC batch item writer. So these are all existing components. They've been around forever. Um, and that's going to write out to a MySQL database. The enrichment item processor is actually going to call to a REST service that we'll have running outside of the batch application. Um, literally, all it's going to do is count how many times it was called. Let's take a look at this really quick to get a lay of the land uh, before we dig into the cloud native stuff. So I'll start off with the, actually I'll start off here. Uh, so if you're familiar with Spring Boot, which I hope you are, this should be a relatively familiar uh, um, class. So I've got my enable batch processing, that, hand, that handles all the batch infrastructure for me, uh, Spring Boot application, and then starting a Spring Boot application just like you would any other Spring Boot app. My job configuration, uh, this is my configuration class. I've got a, a builder for steps. I've got a builder for jobs. Um, we'll get to this execution listener in just a minute. Um, actually, I'll start at the bottom. So I've got a REST template. Boot provides one of these by default uh, for you. I've added this here because in one of our later iterations, we're going to want to manually configure it. Here's our job. So uh, I'm using the Java builder to build this S3 JDBC job. I'm adding a listener. That listener, what it's going to do is it's actually going to look at uh, S3, find the files that it needs to download, and download the files. It's a single step job, so I'll start with the load step, and then I call build. The load step, this.stepbuilderfactory.get load, I'm going to chunk. It's a chunk based step with uh, committing every 20 records. There aren't even 20 records here, so it'll be all in a single transaction. And then I can figure it with the reader, the processor, and the writer that we talked about in the diagram. Here are those three things using the builders that I talked about earlier. So flat file item reader. So we've got this new builder. 
um, call the name. The files are delimited, so I don't have to worry about creating a delimited line tokenizer by hand. The builder handles that for me. I just need to say it is delimited. If there was some type of, uh, um, oops. If there was a, uh, a, pram or a uh, special delimiter, I could pass that in. The names of each column. So I've got three columns in, in the file, so just first, second, third. Those are going to get mapped to this foo class, which literally has first, second, third fields, as well as a message. That's what's going to get populated by that REST service. And then I call build. The enrichment processor, like I said, this is the piece that's actually going to be doing, I'm sorry, this is the piece that's going to be making that REST call. So it's a Spring Batch item processor, and all it's going to use is it's going to use REST template to call this URL and take whatever it gets back, set it as the message on foo, and return foo. The last piece here is the JDBC Batch Item Writer. So here I, I'm taking foo objects. I'm going to write them uh, into the first, second, third, and message columns in the foo table in MySQL. So all this makes sense. Any questions on any of this stuff before we just run it really quick? Okay. Oops. While that's running, just show. I'll drop the database and create the database to show there's nothing up my sleeve. So deal with the new database. That's done. So now I'll go ahead and start the two processes I need to start, which are the REST endpoint and then we'll run our batch job. So our REST endpoint is up, go to the batch job. While that's starting up. Batch process ran, and we can see that's the data imported. Like I said, really impressive data, I know. Questions about any of that? That's what we're going to be iterating on, iterating on for the rest of the talk. Good. So let's go ahead and get to it. So now I know everyone in this room is just like me. We write perfect code. And we've never had systems have any problems in production. It's always that other team, though, that other team that, that causes our, our issues in, in production. So we need to build applications that are resilient, though. We need to build applications that can handle when things go wrong and there are dependencies. And one of the ways we can do that in a cloud-native world is using the circuit breaker pattern. Now, if you've been building web applications, you might have heard of Netflix and Hystrix and that kind of thing. And you can use that within Spring Batch. But actually, Spring Batch comes with a circuit breaker uh, now out of the box. Spring Retry, which is a library that Spring Batch depends on, it actually it came from Spring Batch, uh, has a circuit breaker implementation already built into it. And we're going to use that as part of uh, our processing here to make our process more resilient. Let's take a look at the code. When I push this up, you'll be able to iterate through these versions just by iterating through the commits. All right. So now, job configuration is all the same. What's changed, though, is our enrichment processor. So now we have this annotation here called Circuit Breaker. And this is provided, like I said, from Spring Retry. This isn't anything. Uh, that, there are no additional dependencies to make this work. And so by adding that Circuit Breaker um, annotation, I can now do this, which is recover. Um, so this recovery method takes the same method signature as the initial one there that the circuit breaker is on. So uh, instead of fallback, they take the same parameters and they return the same thing. And so what happens is once that process method calls or throws an exception, the fallback method will be called. And just like any circuit breaker, the circuit will be opened until that's until for a given amount of time, all that's configurable. 
and then it'll try the recover again, or try the original one again. So instead of just having the process exception thrown over and over and over for each uh, request, it'll just fall back to fall back a few times, and then let's say after three times, it'll try to process one. Oh, there's an exception again, well let me just stick with recover for a little longer. Does that make sense? Shoot. There is configuration. So I, actually, I believe by default it's time-based instead of number of executions. Um, but you can configure it either way. Uh, so the question was, can you restart from the beginning? Meaning, so the question was, is can you restart uh, uh, for in the case of a circuit breaker specifically? So the failures in general by Spring Batch are, are, you can skip, you can retry, all that stuff is already built into the framework. This is specifically if you don't want to do either one of those, and you just want to keep processing. So in this case, let's say I, this REST service is down for some reason, and I can actually still get all my records into the database, and I can clean that up later. That's what this is really going to handle. Um, without the overhead of actually doing the skip uh, logic within Spring Batch, which it actually can be rather, uh, it can have a performance hit for doing that. That makes sense to everybody? All right. So. so again, we'll start up our REST service. And then once that's running, we'll get the Job going. Rest is up and running. And so now what we should see happen, so the rest service, actually I should show one other thing, which is what I changed in the rest service. Um, uh, the controller. So the controller before was literally just kicking out the, um, was returning this. Uh, now I've added so that it's randomly, 50% of the time is going to throw an exception. Since this is random, what I'm hoping it will show is that we will see, say, one or two exceptions in the REST application, um, but more than that, errors in our database, because that will mean that we will have, uh, the circuit breaker will have closed and that we will not be actually calling the REST service in an error scenario. Given that this is random, bear with me. Um, so we can see, uh, Ah, uh, wonderful. Try that again. We can see that conference Wi-Fi is not cooperating. There we go. So let's see, we had on the REST service, we had t one exception thrown, two exceptions thrown. So, it was, oh, three exceptions were thrown. All right, yeah, three exceptions were thrown. Let's take a look at what we have in the database. So, the REST service was only called three times, or at least in, in a failure scenario, it seems like they were all, every time it did. And yet, the, um, our failover, our circuit breaker, handled that for us all, what is it, seven times, ten times? So because of that, our, we're not beating up that, that service that's in failure. So that if there's, let's say there's a queue we're reading from and it can't keep up, or there's a service that can't keep up, instead of just beating it up and continuing the problem, we can continue processing on with the circuit breaker. Does that make sense? Cool. Correct, yeah. So the question was, can you provide different intervals? And yes, you can. Yeah. And for the record, it's the, the one that the, the circuit breaker that's provided with Spring Retry is relatively basic. I think it's either number of tries or the time. Um, if you want to get anything more complex, that would be that'd be the time to bring in Hystrix. Um, which, like I said, you can do, but that's additional dependencies, and that really wasn't the goal of this. It's really just to demonstrate that you get circuit breakers out of the box with batch anyways. 
One other thing to note with the circuit breaker implementation is that there was no rollback when, those scenario, when that exception was thrown. On the skip and retry uh, logic within spring batch, when the exception is thrown, the transaction is rolled back, and then we retry each item one at a time to determine which item caused that error. Um, that didn't happen with the uh, circuit breaker here. Um, so because of that, we didn't have to take the performance penalty of that rollback and retry of all those items. So configuration. Uh, up to now, I've just been using a simple application.yaml file that I won't show you because it has passwords hard-coded in it. Obviously, that's not a real practical way to configure applications in a cloud-native production environment. Um, in fact, there's even comments about this in that the cloud or the 12-factor manifesto, separating code and configuration. Um, there's a number of different approaches we can do for this, and I'll show you two options here. Uh, one is using Spring Cloud Config Server. So here I've got a server that ha is backed in, has a backend of a Git repository, and my application will ask the configuration server for its configuration. The other way you can uh, distribute this configuration is via Eureka or service discovery. Here, I've got an application that registers with Eureka, and then if I want to talk to that application, my application then says to Eureka, I need to talk to application B. How do I do that? What are the, what's the information I need? And Eureka responds back with that. We're going to use both here. Specifically, uh, the import process, so the uh, batch job will talk to config server, to get the configuration for the database and S3 and that kind of stuff. Both the REST service and the import service will use Eureka to figure out how to talk to each other. So the REST service, when it launches, will register with Eureka, and then our batch job will ask Eureka for the information on how to talk to the REST service. Let's take a look at that code. Oops. Hello. You guys are seeing stuff, but I'm not. the heck? I have different desktops now. I didn't want that. Sorry about that. I've, I'm looking at a different desktop now. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So... Let's take a look at what, what changed here. On the REST service application, I've, in, I've added this enable discovery client. So this is gonna allow the REST service to register with Eureka when, it's, when it starts up. In the batch job, I've changed two things. I've got enable discovery client here, so that allows me to, um, deter, get, it allows me to talk to Eureka. In this case, it's gonna ask me or it's going to provide the ability for me to ask for that uh, information on how to talk to the REST service. And then in the enrichment processor, I've changed... Uh, actually, let me go back to the job, job config first. This is why I can explicitly configure a REST template. This load-balanced annotation is essentially going to allow Spring to replace the basic REST template that I'm providing with one that knows how to talk to use Eureka. So now when I make my REST calls using REST template, it's going to use the information it gets from Eureka to make that call as opposed to whatever I've just hard-coded in my app. And when we go to the configuration of my app, or the processor using it, you can see instead of localhost 8080 like, like I had before, now I just go by the name REST service, which is what my REST service is going to register with Eureka as. To start Eureka and config server, I'm going to use the Spring shell, which is really nice if you haven't used it before. Uh, so there's a Spring Cloud shell that allows you to, to launch a number of different uh, applications. In this case, I'm going to use it to launch uh, Config Server in Eureka. You can do Hystrix, uh, et cetera. And so this will launch two basic uh, applications for me. There are two basic servers. One's the Config Server and one's Eureka. And then while they're doing that, I will swap out my configuration. Tweet. 
that one I just deleted had all of the uh, um, all of my configuration in it. But now the one I'm going to use is my cloud native one. So now the cloud native one just has this, which is the name of my application. So what is the name of the application I need to get the configuration from config server for? And then in this case, I've got fail fast equals true, which means if I can't talk to the config server, I can't process the rest of my app anyway, so just die. So those apps are both up. Quickly build my app. That's cleared. Now we go back to launch the REST service, and we'll take a look into Eureka and see it once it's registered. Okay, so that's running. Eureka should be here. So this is the Eureka dashboard. And you can see I've got two applications that are already uh, registered. One is the config server that registers by default. You can actually use the config server to provide uh, configuration to Eureka. Um, then my REST service is, has, has registered. So that REST template in my batch job will use this information to know how to talk to the REST service. So instead of using local host, I'll actually use a real IP, et cetera. So now if we go ahead and run our batch job, that exception is ex expected. Um, the Eureka client, uh, when being shut down, uh, doesn't play nice with the life cycle. That's a known bug. We can turn that off uh, if we want. I just haven't yet. Um, but the job actually ran fine. We can check the data. And as you can see, actually, in this case, some of the uh, calls to the REST endpoint worked fine, where other ones actually threw exceptions, and the, the circuit breaker was still triggered. Questions on any of that before we move on? Cool. So one of the important things with batch processing in general is scalability, right? And the cloud, you, it's the whole idea of, or one of the big ideas of the cloud is you get that elastic uh, scalability, right? I can scale up to a number of instances when I need them and drop back down when I don't. Um, scaling with Spring Batch has a number of options that have been around uh, since the beginning. Uh, you've got parallel steps, so I can run two steps in parallel that are unrelated. Um, I've got multi-threaded steps, so I can run chunks in parallel. So I could, you know, chunk one runs and chunk two is running at, at the same time. I've got partitioning, both locally via threads and remote via external processes, as well as remote chunking. In this case, partitioning is the best fit. We're pulling down multiple files that are unrelated, so we can process them in parallel. Uh, basically, each partition becomes a file, or each file gets a partition. Um, and using Spring Cloud Task, which is a re related project, we can actually do this in a much more dynamic way than we have historically. Historically, if you wanted to use external processes to scale a batch job, what you had to do is you had to have the, each one of the workers already running and listening via some type of messaging middleware. That isn't a very elastic way of doing this, because now you've got, you know, let's say you want four partitions plus the master, that's five. Uh, basically application instances sitting out there waiting for work when most of the time batch processing, you know, let's say, runs at night and isn't running 24-7. Spring Cloud Tasks partition capabilities allow you to launch the workers dynamically. So what it does is it will actually launch, um, if you're on Cloud Foundry, it'll launch new Cloud Foundry tasks for each one of your partitions. If you're locally, it'll run new Java processes for each one of your partitions. And the idea is that those start, they do their work, and they shut back down, freeing up those resources when you're done. So if we look at this, uh, the master is going to query Amazon uh, for what files need to be processed, just the file names. It's not going to download anything. It'll store that information in the job repository, one step execution per partition. Then it'll send the information to each worker. And the workers will essentially pick up that information. What do I need to work on from the database? Reply to the database when it's done. 
and it also, the workers will also independently pull, up, pull the data from S3. So the workers are completely independent from the master. Let's take a look at that. We can look at this while it's building. So the real change here is going to be in my, bot, in my job configuration. So I actually now have two profiles. I have a master and a worker profile. The master profile, uh, I've got the, now instead of having a chunk-based step with the reader, processor, and writer, I've got a partition step. So here I configure the name, uh, the step name that I'm going to actually run, which is the same load step that we've been looking at so far. The partitioner, so with the partition step, there are two main components. There's the partitioner and the partition handler. The partitioner is the piece that understands the data and knows how to chop it up into those individual partitions. In this case, we're going to be using a partitioner uh, that comes out of the box with a uh, spring batch called the, my, or the multi-resource uh, partitioner. And that's going to say, for each file I get, create a new partition. The partition handler we're going to use is the new piece that comes from Spring Cloud Task. That's this partition handler. So we configure our partition step. We, like I said, provide the partitioner, the partition handler, and call build. The job, uh, we're just configuring it for the master. The partitioner, like I said, is this uh, one that's provided out of the box for, for uh, Spring Batch. So multi-resource partitioner, we give it a list of, or an array of resources. So in this case, we use uh, uh, Spring Cloud AWS to resolve the files on AWS on AWS. Uh, we drop those uh, in here and then return the partitioner. The deployer partition handler is the, is the piece of magic that allows you to dynamically launch those processes um, as tasks. So this uses an abstraction within Spring Cloud called a, call a deployer. So you, we've got deployers for all the platforms that we support. So local, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, I think those are all the ones right now. We've got some work on some of the other ones, Mesos and whatnot, a yarn. Um, but so what this does is we provide it uh, some basic configuration. It takes a command line args provider. So uh, what are the command line args that, are, that each one of my workers are going to take? This is what, essentially what this is, the deployer is going to do is it's going to do the Java dash jar for us on whatever platform we're running on. So if that's Cloud Foundry, it would be doing the CF push with the appropriate command line args. If we were doing it locally, like I am right now, um, it would be the, doing the equivalent of Java dash jar with the appropriate parameters on it. So in this case, command line args will provide the appropriate command line args. I'm not setting any environment variables here, so I'm just providing a, a provider here that doesn't do anything. I'm configuring the max number of workers as two. Uh, you, it's a, probably a good idea to set a max on this. Uh, so that if your partitioner returns, I need a thousand partitions, it doesn't launch a thousand workers uh, blindly. And the last piece is the application name. That's a task thing. So I return the partition handler. That's everything within the work uh, within the master uh, job. The worker is really uh, a couple things. Number one, it is the configuration of the step. That's all the same stuff that we've looked at already. So I've got my reader, my processor, and my writer building the step itself. There's the rest template. The only difference is, is before we had a job execution listener to do the download of the files from S3. Now we have that at the step execution level. The reason for that is because the workers are what need that file. And if you're working in a cloud environment, the step is running independently of the master, right? So I don't want the master to be what has access to that file. The workers need access to the files. So the steps are now responsible for downloading their own data. But otherwise, the actual implementation here is uh, the same as, as the other ex, uh, listener. So that should be done building. So we can go ahead and start up our REST service. And now this one will take a little longer, the batch job will take a little longer to run because it's actually going to be starting those remote processes 
to do the actual work. So it's actually, we're actually going to have three, three JVM processes just for the batch job running. So can get that guy going. Now while that's going. So you can see we've got the batch job. That's the master. We've got config server, rest service. And now you can see we've got batch job, batch job, batch job. Those are the workers running as well as the master. They're still running. And now they finished up. And so this should be done. No, actually, it's wrapping up. And so job finished. And we should be able to check our data. And there's our data. And we can actually, one other thing we can take a look at This is the actual uh, step execution table. This is what re uh, can reads the um, or maintains the state of the of each step execution. And so you can see, while we have a single step job, we actually have three step executions. We've got the master, and then we've got load part load partition one and load partition zero. Those are the two step executions for the partitions as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So you'll well, you need uh, access to it. So whether it's whether you're running the native MySQL. So the question was, how do you uh, do the the job repository within Cloud Foundry? Um, so you'd need either whether you're going to use like the MySQL tile or you know bring your own service via Cups, whatever option you are. But you do need a database there. Correct. Yeah. So you, uh, the question was, do I need um, uh, special permissions to, to launch tasks? Um, and yeah, you would need uh, space level permissions for uh, this. You really, the batch job is run no differently than Dataflow. Um, so uh, you would need to configure uh, via probably config server uh, username and password for like a service type account. But the player handles all of that. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um, in fact, I didn't show spe that specific piece. Um, where is it at? Deployer. Oh, that's right, that's in a starter. Uh, so I don't have to configure that specifically, but there is a Cloud Foundry deployer implementation that's brought into this. It's brought in via a starter, so I don't, have to, I don't have to actually configure that. Yeah. Uh, I know that you're using the profile application. Yep. My guess is that you just have a copy of the application running under the profile. Uh, no, so, so the question was basically why am I using the profiles? So I've got the master profile and the worker profile. I don't want, when I start the boot, so I'm running the same boot application three times. I don't want each one of the workers to also relaunch my batch job uh, when they, because by default boot will launch any batch job that it finds. So the job itself is only defined in the master. Yeah. They have the same yes. Yep. The same Correct, yeah, the, the context is different. The application context is configured differently. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Um, I don't think I, yeah, I didn't get, uh, there's no common stuff between here, so I've got it broken up into the two, but anything that boot starters are providing would be, uh, would be common across the both. Yeah. So the question was, is how do you figure out what the max number of workers is? That's a really loaded question. <laughs> uh, yeah, it really depends on the process, uh, resource availability, you know, what you're doing with it. Um, I, I do personally prescribe to an over-partition uh, philosophy. Um, I recommend people over-partitioning in general. Um, it allows for a little bit of a load balancing effect across them. Um, but yeah, it really depends. One feature we're, we're looking to add in, in Spring Cloud Task, uh, uh, the, one of the upcoming versions, is um, right now each each worker part processes a single partition at a time. Um, that may not be the most efficient use of resources because you may not need all of a JVM to process like the files we're working on. Um, so we're looking at, at being able to pass multiple partitions to a single uh, worker instance. 
uh, so that you can even better utilize those resources, um, which, uh, while dances around your question, will probably actually muddy the answer even worse. <laughs> mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Correct, yeah, so the question was, how does this work with CF scale, and basically it doesn't. Uh, if you do CF scale, uh, you're essentially, essentially gonna be relaunching the master over. Um, so if that's okay for you, that's fine, but typically the way you would handle this is by doing this via uh, partitions um, and handling it that way. If you needed to be dynamic with the partitions, um, you could set your application up so that you use like config server and use the live refresh capabilities there and, config and modify it that way. Uh, no, so each one of these workers is a separate AI, uh, application instance on Cloud Foundry. So they have their own, uh, their own droplet, their own uh, memory space, the whole nine yards. So, so you're, yeah, you're restricted, the only restriction you have is how big is your foundation. You can take up every AI within your foundation with this if you want. All good questions, yeah. So the question is, is there a way to, to find out if the worker is ready for more work? Um, and basically, it's not how the work is provided to the worker. That's the way it's provided to the worker in, well, actually in both ways, it's a pull method as opposed to a push method. Um, so the worker, well, at least in the traditional method, it's a pull method. The worker asks for work and it's ready. In this case, you only get a single task to do. So I give you a task, you go off and do it and shut down. So there is no, are you ready for new work? Um, Let's talk, about that. Let's talk about that one offline. Um, there's a number of different options for it. Uh, it will be shortly after this talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're worried about working about a large file, let, let's take that specific one. Uh, well, actually, let me ask you guys. Do you want me to, to dig into that now or? Okay, I'm seeing enough head, head nods, okay. Okay, <laughs> so large files pose a problem with, with batch processing in the cloud uh, in general. The fundamental problem is, is you don't have a lot of, a lot of space on a disk, right? It's, you have to put it somewhere in order to process it. So typically we recommend either chopping it up if you can uh, in advance before you get it down, down there and we can do that, you know, uh, I don't know if I could do it with S3, I'd have to play around with it, but like, if I was pulling this off an FTP server, I could split it on the server before I bring it down, if that's possible. Otherwise, we highly recommend just slamming it into like a staging table and then doing the scaling capabilities off of the staging table. So, because you, the concurrency models around a database mo uh, system are a lot more, uh, you've got a lot more options than processing a single file. So I can run multiple partitions against a staging table, whereas I can't against a single large file. Does that answer the question? So, so basically, you don't care how you split it with a database or other flat files, that's flat files. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, we had a pull request uh, a while ago um, that explored the, the idea of a multi-threaded uh, uh, flat file reader um, that was literally, you would take one file and it would use pointers to, uh, to figure out what, you know, what offset to start reading from kind of thing. Um, and we'd never committed it specifically because uh, most people view more threads equals faster. But that's not always the case. And in fact, uh, this thing, the, the reader on certain platforms and certain scenarios was more performant, but in most cases it wasn't and we didn't want that to be confusing. Other questions, all good ones by the way. Excellent question. So if a worker fails, what happens? So if a worker fails, that's one of the beauties of that table that I sh just showed with the step executions. It'll be marked as failed there. And what I can do is I can rerun my job and it will only run the failed ones again. So, it, so if I've got five, five partitions, one fails, when I restart my job, only the one that failed will be run again. 
Correct. We'll get, I'll get to that one at the very end. <laughs> Uh, so the question was is uh, basically how would this work with HDFS when you've got local blocks anyways? But, um, there are tools within uh, Spring for Apache Hadoop that I believe there is an actual reader that will, that, that will read locally like that. So the question was is, is uh, basically, um, uh, let, me, let me see if I can rephrase it and, and call me out if, I, if I'm rephrasing it incorrectly. In a modern uh, development world, uh, API approaches are probably safer than, than uh, direct access to data stores. Uh, and so uh, what would this look like if I actually did that? Um, it really depends. Uh, so batch processing is still a bit of an, uh, a bit of, um, an exception to the rule, if you will. Uh, given that um, pure performance perspectives. Um, we, you can do it with bulk, bulk stuff. It would be a custom writer. We don't have anything out of the box for that. Um, but typically APIs, there are an overhead for. And it really depends on, on what you're trying to accomplish with the batch process. I know I probably just either tap dance around your question. Well, I heard, I heard, another, I heard another word about a while back about boundaries. Mm -hmm. Direct access to the database, it is, uh, and part of that is goes along with the domain-driven design. What are you defining as your domain? What are you can, defining as a microservice? What, so the, those APIs are supposed to be the, the single source of truth, right? Well, you can consider this batch job as part of that that service, if you will. That's that's the way I look at it. Is it's doing things um, as part of that service because nobody's calling in the batch job directly, typically, right? So. Um, I consider it a bit of a loophole, but I'm probably a bit biased. I do have one more, one more example. These are all great questions, um, but a lot of these are getting into just general batch stuff. And let me get through the, the one more example, and then we can uh, go with bat, right, generic batch, batch stuff for the rest of the time. Is that OK? Especially since it goes to your question. <laughs> How do we orchestrate this stuff on the cloud? So up to now, I've been doing just Java dash jar on a local uh, command line. It's the equivalent of doing CF push, right? But chances are, for every one of your uh, batch jobs, you're not going to have some operator doing CF push at the time you want to run it, right? Or even task launch, um, which is where Spring Cloud Dataflow comes in. So Spring Cloud Dataflow is a cloud-native orchestration tool for microservices. Um, I highly recommend checking out uh, talk talks by Mark Pollack. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, continuous de uh, delivery with uh, Spinnaker, which, or I'm sorry, with uh, Skipper, as well as a talk on Dataflow itself. And also, um, Oleg Zerkowski is doing a talk on the streaming side of Dataflow. But what it really does is Dataflow allows you the ability to launch via REST, streams, or on demand uh, these tasks. So it's going to handle the deployment to Cloud Foundry. It's going to handle the um, monitoring aspect. So you can view that job repository. You can start, stop, restart, all those types of things. You can orchestrate dependencies between batch jobs. So if I have batch job two that has to execute after batch job one, I can configure that with a DSL or a, or a drag and drop GUI um, so that I can actually do all of that uh, in a cloud native way. Let's take a look at Spring Cloud Dataflow. So for Spring Cloud Dataflow, 
there's actually uh, only one minor change to the um, job itself, and that is enable task. So that's going to enable uh, a bunch of functionality similar to Spring Batch in that it has uh, a job re or task repository that monitors start, stop, restart, and all those kinds of things. Um, but they're not specific to Spring Batch. So now if in the cloud native world, if you had a workload that was just say, um, I've got a database migration I want to run, you know, something like Liquibase or something like that. Um, and I want to run that in my, uh, in my production environment, but I need to know, did it run? When did it run? Did it uh, complete successfully? Those kinds of things. And so I can run that as a task, and I get the same repository style um, information, like I said, start, or the start time, end time, results, all those kinds of things uh, in a database for you out of the box. It also provides a bunch of other features like listeners, so I can be notified via messaging a task started, a task ended. Um, within Spring Batch, it also adds listeners for, if I run a batch job within a task, it adds listeners for a job started, it ended. Uh, it was a uh, step A started, ended, and so forth. That's really the only change, though, to the rest of this job. Um, so the job is built. Go ahead and start up my stuff. Um, over here. Start my rest endpoint first. And then I'm not actually going to be running the job myself this time. I'm going to have Spring Cloud Dataflow do it. So just like everything within this ecosystem, tasks, batch jobs, ta uh, streams, uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow is a boot application. So I just do it, I run it just the same as I would anything else, java-jar, the name of the jar file. So it also has an interactive shell that we can use. Um, I'll focus on the UI, but I just want to bring it up and show you really quick. So this is the interactive shell. Um, if I don't know what to do, I can hit tab, and it tells me what to do. Um, the way this works is you register applications with Dataflow, and then you create definitions from those applications uh, as a way to execute your application. So the, when you register, you're essentially saying, this is the name of the application, here's where to find the bits. So in this case, I'll be using Maven coordinates on where to find the bits. Once you have that registration, then I can create definitions which are essentially configured versions of that application. So run application A with these properties and these parameters. Run application A with these other properties and these parameters. And then I can launch those definitions dynamically. Like I said, we've got a shell here. We also have a UI. This is the current GA UI. We are in the process of updating it. Uh, you'll see that in Mark Pollock's talks, as well as Gunnar's giving a talk on that uh, migration path from uh, Angular 1 to Angular, whatever version they are using these days, 4, 5, <laughs> whatever JavaScript fe feels like is a good uh, number today. Um, but so this is the UI. There's a number of tabs here. Let's walk through them really quick. I've got apps, which is a list of all my application, uh, applications that are registered. I've got runtime, so if I have applications running, this will list out those applications, the number of instances, and so forth. I'm going to skip over streams because we're, this isn't a streaming talk and other people are covering that tab. Tasks, so I talked about that task repository um, that, that has that, that data similar to Spring Batch. So this is where you can browse that task repository. Spring Batch jobs are obviously a common use case for Spring Cloud Tasks, so we have a special tab for, for that. You can do some cool analytics with Dataflow, and then obviously there's an About tab. So let's go ahead and register our, our application. So S3 JDBC. We register an application with a type, so it's either a source, processor, sync, or task. Source, processors, and syncs are all um, uh, message-based microservices. Like I said, go listen to Oleg uh, to get more information on that. 
we're doing tasks. And then we just provide the coordinates. So in this case, um, maven colon slash slash means I'm providing the a maven URL. And then I've got uh, group name colon artifact ID colon version. Let's go ahead and register that. So that's registered. So you can see it here as well. Um, and we can do task create. And so I'll give it a name, my job, and then definition. Now, if, I, if my job took parameters, I could do you know, dash dash foo equals bar, et cetera. But I'm using Cloud Config to, uh, and Eureka to manage my configuration. So literally, my definition is just that. So task create. And then if we go over here, I'm just bouncing back and forth so you can see the functionality of both. Uh, you can see it's there. I can launch it via here, or I can do it job. So that's launched. And so now if we go to executions, you'll see it's in the process of starting. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to launch a separate JVM process for the master, and the master will launch additional JVM process for each one of the workers. So we go over here. You can see the batch job, the partitions are already running. Um, so we go here. The tasks are running. See the job here. Uh, we can go and take a look into here. So you can see we've got uh, the two partitions. Each one of those, they're already finished. Um, they took you know three seconds. Each one read four, write four. There were no uh, skips or rollbacks or anything like that. So we can go back. Oops. So we go back to tasks, executions. So that's done as well. And then we can check our data. Oops, wrong check. Any you can see what it is. Is there any way to see this information outside of the UI? Uh, so the question was, there any way to see this information outside of the UI? So good question. So uh, all this data is uh, available uh, via the, the shell, for one. Uh, so task list. Um, So you can see that, that stuff. There's the same thing for job. It's all available there. Both of these, the UI and the shell, sit on top of a REST API. And there is a data flow template, I think REST template, um, that, a lot, that exposes all of this stuff that way as well. So if you wanted to write an application that consumed all this stuff, you could. So to answer your question specifically about uh, Spring Batch Admin, Spring Batch Admin is going into the attic at the end of the year. Um, we recommend using Dataflow going forward, um, whether it be via this local uh, in, uh, instance that I'm showing, as well as, um, or if you're running on a cloud uh, environment, obviously, in a cloud environment, the, the proposition is a lot more. Questions on any of the Dataflow stuff? So with that, um, by, provide, by using these cloud-native tools with, in, across the rest of the Spring Cloud ecosystem, um, you can really build batch processes uh, that are uh, deployed in the cloud and take really good use of the cloud-native re resources. That's all I got. Question? Pardon? Can you use this as an alternative to Spark streaming? Yeah, depending on what you want to do with it. Other questions? Yeah. So the question is when to use the built-in batch fault tolerance capabilities versus a circuit breaker. And that's really more of a business decision than a, uh, a reliability. 
Right, right, right. It, it's, so in this case, a failure, we can just continue processing. There are some batch processing where a failure means you can't continue. You have to stop. Um, the, the next record is dependent on the previous one, so there is no option to, to just skip it and move on. Um, also, uh, if, you are, if there's a finite amount of errors that you're concerned with, um, the skip logic, they're actually, you have to configure a maximum number of skips. Um, so if you are determining, uh, and for the record, you can use all of this in conjunction with each other, right? Uh, if I wanted to do uh, this type of thing for the, the enrichment that I was doing, but I wanted to use uh, skip logic for parsing errors in a file, if, uh, I might do that because uh, if, I've, if I'm getting, if every record in the file is, if is a parse error, I'll hit the max skip, the job will fail, because there's something fundamentally wrong with the file, it's corrupt. I'm not going to continue going through the whole thing. But this, the circuit breaker isn't, that, that's my input. I'm not going to do, do that with this. So that doesn't make sense. So it really, it's really a business use case scenario. In the back, yeah. Good question. So where, where's scheduling within data flow? Uh, so we have some capabilities uh, uh, that you can write your own and use messaging to do that. The Spring Cloud Stream is, is a way to launch stuff. There is actually a task launch uh, application uh, or capabilities within Spring Cloud Task that you can use. And basically, you'd write a little app that wraps quartz and has it send a message. Um, there's also within Cloud Foundry, there's a scheduler that's, that's available to launch stuff. Um, it really depends. Uh, schedulers are a rather religious topic in most enterprises. Um, so once they pick one, whatever that may be, uh, they most enterprises tend to either really not want to touch it or want to ditch it. And so our goal is really to integrate with whatever scheduler you're using. So if you want to use Quartz, well, we can work with Quartz. If you want to use, um, you know, what is it, UC4 or whatever, what, Control M, we can do that as well. You got it. You got it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Using you're talking about using the uh, uh, the task launcher capabilities or the master slave that we looked at here with the the master workers. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. And actually, um, with, with, um, uh, with tasks on Cloud Foundry, they're guaranteed to run at most once, so they won't be restarted, um, which um, uh, the capabilities that Spring Batch provide actually help with that, because if, it, they're, if, let's say, the master crashed and the workers were still going, that's actually OK, because when they're done, you can relaunch the master, and only the workers that failed will be rerun anyway. So if they all succeeded, if they all finished fine, the master will just keep going without re-executing that other stuff. Well, there's a difference between restarting and relaunching. Restarting is taking the, the job execution and relaunching that with the same parameters. Restarting, or relaunching would be, I'm just going to run the, this batch job again with, like you said, a new timestamp. Um, so, again. Okay. Good question. No, it does not. So there's, there's no dependency on, on data flow for any of this. So the, the uh, master is going to launch the workers um, uh, by calling the APIs that, uh, of the Cloud Foundry APIs. Um, it actually the, the, it uses a Cloud Foundry deployer, which uses the, the Java client, um, and that it interacts directly with it. Uh, the question was, does this require Spring Boot 2 or is this 1.5? And it, all my demos were 1.5.
They work fine with two as well, just everything I did was with one and five. So the question was, is, uh, uh, can, be, can it be turtles all the way down, meaning can you, a master will launch workers and workers launch more workers and so forth? Uh, that you get into a pretty dangerous scenario down there. I would really, if, if that's a scenario you're looking at, I would really start look, uh, considering reevaluating how, how you're architecting the, the solution. Um, that being said, you can use a job to launch jobs. That's a little different. Um, and that's something we actually do, uh, the composed task, which is our ability to launch or orchestrate jobs. So have job one run, then job two run after one is su completed successfully and so forth. That's orchestrated via a spring batch job. Um, and that's something that uh, is common, having a job run other jobs. So the question was, is, is it a bad practice to do your writing in the processor? And yes, it is a bad practice. Um, uh, I'm not sure I follow on that part. Well, you can, you can write a custom item writer, right? Because um, the, 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 reason the reason for not writing in, in the processor, a uh, couple reasons. Number one, uh, the contract of the item processor is intended to be item potent. We may call the item processor multiple times on a single item. Uh, in, in a skip scenario or a retry scenario specifically, um, when we roll back the transaction, if let's say I've got five items in that transaction and number three is the one that failed, um, one and two will be reprocessed. So there's, there's that risk when you're doing a right there. Um, yeah, that's, that's the main reason. Um, also, obvious, there's obvious uh, I.O. optimizations you can get in a write because we, we batch that up, right? The process method is one at a time. So if you're, if you're inserting to a database, there's no batch insert you can do, um, whereas in the writer, you can actually do a, a batch insert, for example. So the question is, is uh, how, do you, how do you handle active-active um, uh, uh, foundations or active-active data centers? Um, so that gets, uh, at some point, the rubber needs to meet the road, and somebody needs to uh, be responsible for who's going to be the one that grabs that. Um, or the state needs to be shared across there in some capacity, whether that's the orchestration tool that is a scheduler, whether that's the job repository as a database. At some point, somebody needs to know, hey, I got this. Um, there are ways to handle that so that um, if you wanted, let's say, to launch the jobs in both, and then the first one that gets it is, is the winner kind of thing, there's ways to do that. Um, but yeah, at, at some point you're gonna have shared state, whether it be, like I said, at the scheduler orchestration layer or at the job repository layer. So the ability to, or the, the question is, is, is that built in the spring batch? The I got it thing, yeah, if you run the same job, um, if you run the same job with the same parameters and try and do it twice, uh, one will fail. Uh, assuming that, assuming that, that the, you've got the transaction serialization set up to a point where you know, one will win on that. But um, yeah, the, it should only launch once at a time. That's, the whole, that's one of the reasons we have that shared database is for that very, very uh, reason is at some point you need a lock saying that, that I'm, I'm the guy or I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one running it. So um, the, that, that key grab provides that. Other questions? That's all I've got, ladies and gentlemen, so thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.